Good morning. My name is Griff Carasolo. I'm the pastor here at Sharon United Methodist Church, and it is my privilege to welcome you to church here this morning. Whether you are a member or a guest, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. I have a couple of announcements to share with you this morning. The first is that we are continuing our Epworth Children's Home collection. Uh, we are collecting diapers and uh, pajama, kids' pajamas. Uh, and there is a donation stack that is forming in the corner of our gathering space. So if you want to bring those before the end of the month and drop those off there, you're more than welcome to. There is also, we are also uh, collecting financial donations as well for the Columbia Center for Epworth Children's Home as well. And there are details in your bulletin on how to fill out that check. Uh, the other announcement that I have to share is for all the men in the room. We are having a men's dinner tomorrow uh, night uh, in the gym at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll be having barbecue, so we hope that you will uh, join us tomorrow night and be with us for a time of fellowship and talking about what is next with the United Methodist Men. So those are all the announcements that I have to share this morning. I know Kelly and Gray both have announcements, so Kelly, would you come forward and announce, and then afterwards, Gray, you can share your announcement as well. Good morning. Um, just a quick announcement about VBS again. I promise I won't bug you every week, but I might. Um, we're still looking for volunteers. There should be a volunteer form in the bulletins. If anyone would like to volunteer or if you have any questions about volunteering, just ask me and Amy. Um, we'd love to have you here. I promise we'll have a fun week. Um, you might be tired every night, but we have a great time. And I'll feed you every night, and I'll teach you some cool dances. So if anybody's interested, just let me know. Or if you have any questions, let me know. Also, parents, if you haven't registered your children yet, there's a QR code that you can see. Um, scan that, it takes you straight to our link, and you can get your kids registered, or there are actual paper forms out here in the gathering space. Thanks. Well, there's a lot of cool things that are going on in the life of the church right now, and the reason why I wanted to come up here was to let you know that next week is sort of our special that we've got going on with Crossfire Student Ministry. So next week is two things for us. It's graduation Sunday, so we get a chance to recognize those graduates in the church family that have worked so hard at high school or college graduation. So we've got a couple of those that are coming up here. And just one last reminder, if you've got somebody in your family that's graduating that we need to recognize come next week, Please find me today and let me know. We want to get them a gift, get them a little bit of recognition. But on top of that, next week is our Youth Sunday. Our Youth Sunday is something that we try to do twice a year. Many of you here have seen it before, but it's a very, very special day in the life of the church when we get to have Crossfire Student Ministries come forward and we're going to handle the message. We're going to handle the music. We handle the prayer, everything. We really want to showcase the talents that we have and then on top of that, showcase how we worship God in Crossfire. But even more than that, one really special thing that I like to highlight about Crossfire or special thing that I like to highlight about uh, Youth Sunday is that we've got three families in this church now whose very first Sunday at Sharon United Methodist was a Youth Sunday. They came and they saw the youth actually participating. They came and they saw our youth plugged in, our students moving. And I know that I've talked to so many and they, they are looking for a church home where the students can be a part of the church. This is a perfect opportunity. If you've got somebody in your life that you know that really wants to find a church home and has students that they want to get involved, this is the best time that you'll have to bring them. We hope to see everybody next week because they're going to see their friends at school up here sharing the message, playing music, and we want everybody here to be a part of it. So I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. As Gray mentioned, there is a lot happening within the life of the church, and those, those other announcements are in your bulletin. But at this time, I want to invite you to stand as we join together in our opening hymn.
You all may be seated, and at this time I do want to invite the Dempseys and Allison to come forward as we have uh, two families that are joining our church today. Uh, as always, they will have some questions that they will answer, but there will also be some questions that you will answer as well as, uh, as the church because you all are receiving them into uh, your membership. And, and both Allison and the Dempseys are both coming from transfer from other United Methodist congregations. Um, and so for all of you, I have a couple of questions. Allison, you don't have to hide back there. <laughs> there you go. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please say, I do. Church, do you, as Christ's body, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, please say, we do. We Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? Let us all join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Spirit. Allison and Dempsey's, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, please say, I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, please say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Church, would you welcome your new family members this morning? And at this time, I'm going to invite you to welcome them, not from afar anymore, but to come on up and shake your hands and shake other people's hands as well, sharing the peace of Christ.
So it is a blessing to be a part of this church, and I, I can't tell you how proud I am of this church and the ministry that we have done accomplishing God's mission of making disciples and making a difference. Just this year alone, I don't know if you've been keeping track, I have, we've had 27 people join our fellowship since January. This is what it looks like to make disciples and to make a difference, to welcome those who are looking for a church home, to invite those into our fellowship who are looking for faith, who are looking for hope, and are looking to be loved. And so we are certainly blessed that God is working through our church to make disciples and to make a difference wherever we are. Before we take the offering here in a few moments, there are a couple of things that I would ask of you. If you are a guest and you would like to connect with us, we have these connect cards that are in the pew in front of you. We would love to connect with you and help you take your next steps in your faith journey. So you can fill this out and then put it in the offering plate when it comes by here in a few moments. Again, we just want to connect with you and help you accomplish God's mission in your life as well. But uh, as a note and uh, you know, we're, we're finishing up our Asking for a Friend sermon series today, but I know there are many questions that you have on your hearts and on your minds as well. So there should be, and maybe there's not because of the early service, but there should be these little index cards uh, at the end of each of your pews. What I would love for you to do here in the next few moments, and you can do this even while I'm talking to you right now, is to write down some questions that you would like for me to address in a future sermon series. We may not do it within the next uh, six months or so, but I do hope to do another sermon series like this one, uh, maybe within the next year or so. So if you have questions that you would love for me to talk about or you would love to explore a little bit more, write them down on this little index card uh, and put it in the offering plate or hand it to me after the service as well because I, I want to answer the questions that you are asking because we all have questions and we all need that space to be able to ask those questions and to dive a little bit deeper. So. With all of that said, I want to invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. 
Lord Jesus Christ, we offer these gifts back to you, thanking you for how you have blessed us. And Lord, we ask that these gifts, these tithes, these offerings may be used to make disciples and to make a difference here in our church, in our community, and throughout the world. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'll remain standing as we sing our next hymn, O Worship the King. all may be seated and I want to invite the kids to come down for children's time. something funny? All right. You see? You see something funny? It's you. That's right. You're funny, right? <laughs> All right. So you saw yourself, but what do we call this? Camera. A reflection. What did you say? Did you say reflection? There's another word. Not refraction. Starts with an I. All right, what if I did this? All right, Reagan, smile for me. All right. So now, yes, I have a picture of Reagan. Can we tell some things about Reagan by looking at this picture? What can we tell about her? She's smiling. She's happy. Wearing a blue dress. In church, does she look nice and sweet in that picture? So we can tell a lot of things just by looking at this, right? So we see an image of Reagan looking at this picture, right? We see an image. So can this image, is it actually the person? Yeah. Yes. Kind of. Kind of. But the image can't talk. But it does show us a lot of what she's like, right? Well, in the book of... Coloss, Col I can't say the word, Colossians, Paul talks about where our salvation and hope come from and how we are a part of God's image. 
So if I were to ask you, what do you think God's image looks like? What would you say? A savior? What? Sitting on a throne in heaven? We don't. We've never seen him. We've seen pictures of him, though, right? But is it there an image back behind me? Kind of like a drawing. So, yeah, we don't have an exact image of what he looks like. But in the Bible, it also talks about how the sun is the image of God. Now, who is the sun? Jesus. Good, y'all got it right this time. The firstborn of all creation and head of the church. We obviously can't see him in person, but the son's image has been given to us so that we can see who God is. Just like Jesus reflects God, like in our picture. Yes, and we want to reflect him too. Are we going to ever be perfect like he is? No, but we can act and reflect and do the things that he does, right? Yes, we can pray like he does. Be kind. Do we come to church? Yes. What else are some things that we can reflect and point others back to him? Help others. Kind of be like he was, right? Okay, yep. Well, we know that he is worth listening to because of the life and the death. And then what came after that? The, yes, the resurrection. So he sent his perfect image, which was who? Jesus. Jesus, to restore God's image so that we can accept him as our Savior. Right? All right, let's bow our heads and say a little prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for sending us your image so that we can try to live our life like you. We know that we are not God, but we were created to be like you and reflect what you are like. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So today we are wrapping up our sermon series called Asking for a Friend. And again, I would uh, ask that if you haven't uh, found one of the index cards or haven't thought of any questions yet, I would love for you to write those down and give those to me afterwards. Uh, but we have been in this ser series for four weeks now, uh, including today. And the questions that we have covered uh, have been maybe some questions that you have thought about. Questions like, what is the Bible and why should I read it? Questions like, is my anxiety or depression a sin? Last week we talked about, uh, can I be a Christian without the church? And so today we're going to wrap all of this up with the question, do all religions teach the same thing? So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would speak to us this day, that you would speak to our hearts, and that you would say something so very clear that our lives would be changed. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Several, several years ago, my family and I went to Asheville for a weekend where they had this huge festival, a festival that had 300,000 people descending upon Asheville for the weekend. And Asheville already is an interesting enough place by itself, but with 300,000 people coming in across the country to this festival, there were a lot of different kinds of people walking around on the streets. Now, there was one morning in particular where I met a very interesting person. It was very early in the morning. I was a college student, so 7 o'clock was very early in the morning for me. And I was sitting down there in the hotel lobby, enjoying the free continental breakfast of the hotel that my family was staying in. And I had my coffee over here, my first cup of coffee, and then I had my Bible on the other side. And there I was sitting when I saw this man, because I never sit to, at a restaurant or in a hotel room with my back to the door. It's a paranoia thing. So uh, I never sit with my back to the door. So I saw this man walk into the hotel lobby. And I say walk, probably a little bit more staggered into the hotel lobby. And he looked at me, looked at the Bible, and looked back at me. And he staggered over to me and he said, my friend, are you a Christian? And well, I said, yes not really wanting to get into a conversation, because again, it was really early in the morning for me. But you know what he did? He pulled up a chair and decided to sit down, and I got the sense that this man, while I was starting my day, was probably just wrapping up his previous day at seven o'clock in the morning, if you know what I'm saying. So he's sitting down, and we started to have this conversation. I found out that this guy's name is Archie, and that he wasn't around, uh, uh, from around the Asheville area, and then I found out that this man was a Buddhist. And so I got to learn a little bit more about his Buddhist faith, his Buddhist philosophy, all these sort of conversations. I shared with him a little bit about why I was a Christian and how I felt called into the ministry. And so we had this wonderful, respectful, uh, cordial conversation with one another. And eventually Archie had enough with me and decided, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to go to the hotel room that I'm in. So he got, gets up and he turns to walk away and then turns back and looks at me and he says, my friend, I want to share one thing with you. You and I, we're not that different. You know, we're just striving for the same place by different roads. And with that, he walked away. You see, Archie represents a mindset. A mindset of, yes, being respectful, being cordial, being polite, but also a mindset that runs just a little bit deeper than just that. A mindset that lives by the mantra that all religions teach the same thing. That all religions, no matter whether it's an Eastern religion, a Western religion, no matter whether it's a philosophy or not, they all basically teach the same thing. As he said, we are all trying to get to the same place. We're just all on different kinds of roads. Now listen, I, I understand the sentiment behind this, uh, this statement, that all religions basically believe the same thing. And I think it's rooted in a very good place. You see, our culture is becoming more and more diverse by the very day. It's becoming more and more diverse with its population, and of course with that comes diversity of religion. So these days, we are now uh, just as prone to encounter somebody who is a Christian as somebody who is a, of another faith, maybe of the Islamic faith, maybe of the Buddhist faith, maybe of the Hindu faith. So this phrase, all religions basically teach the same thing, I think is rooted in a good place. 
that we're just trying to be polite and respectful of one another, that we're trying to coexist and tolerate one another. We're just trying to be nice to everybody else. But is it the right approach to life? I think this was maybe perhaps our best response as the world became more and more diverse. I think it was, this was the best response that we heard to try to be respectful. And quite frankly, maybe this was the best response that the church could ever give us because we weren't able to articulate our own faith. We weren't able to reason our own faith. We weren't able to tell the difference from one's faith to another faith because they all kind of sound the same at one level. They all teach respect. They all teach to love. They all have this golden rule to treat others the way you would want to be treated. So they all kind of seem the same, maybe built on the same foundation. However, we would fool ourselves to think that this is the first time that the church has ever, has ever encountered a diversity of religions. You see, very early on in the church's existence, in the first century A.D., the church was not the main faith that existed. In fact, the main faith that existed during that time was the Roman faith. And the Roman faith actually probably had more in common with this. All religions teach the, the same thing than, well, any other faith. Because the Romans were warriors. They were conquerors. So they would come in and conquer a nation. They would conquer a people. And the best way that they figured out how to keep those people calm was to let them keep their religion. So they would go into this nation and say, listen, we respect that you worship this God. We respect that you worship this deity. Boy, have we got an offer for you. You can keep your deity, and we'll just add the deity to our pantheon. You've heard of Zeus and Hera, Jupiter and Mars, all that. Well, your deity will be on the same level as those. You can worship whoever you want to. You can have it your way as long as you are a fine, respectable Roman citizen. That was the practice that they had. So the church existed in an incredibly diverse, religiously diverse culture. And so the church had to learn how to navigate it. The church that wasn't on top, the church that wasn't the power that it has been in recent memory, was actually this small faction. And they had to learn how to navigate all these other religions. And one of those ways that we are offered is out of the book of Colossians. Now Paul is writing to this church at uh, Colossae, and he is writing all of this, and there are, debating, there are philosophies that are being debated back and forth, even among the church, about who Jesus Christ is, and whether Jesus Christ is just one of many of the gods that they worshipped. And this is what Paul writes to the, church, uh, to the church in Colossians. He says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So this is, what, this is my bottom line for you today. This is what I want you to ponder as we talk about this question, uh, all do all religions teach the same thing? Jesus, Lord, liar, or lunatic? Jesus, Lord, liar, or lunatic? Now here's what I think. Based on this passage in Colossians, based on the rest of Scripture, that the center point of the Christian faith is not a thought, it's not an idea, it's not the Ten Commandments, it's not the golden rule to treat others the way you would want to be treated, it's not even the commandment that Jesus gives to love God and love your neighbor. That is not the center of the Christian faith. Instead, I believe that the center of the Christian faith is a person. It is a person, and that person's name is Jesus Christ. At the center of everything that we do, 
at the center of everything that we believe, at the center of how we gather, at the center of our culture, has to be the person of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Paul is doing here in this, book, in this passage of Colossians. While there are debating philosophies going back and forth all around the church, what he is telling them is to listen, stand firm on the fact that your faith relies upon Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? Well, Paul talks about it in Colossians, that Jesus Christ is the image, not a image, but the image of the invisible God. That he is the firstborn among creation. He has first place among creation. And through him, all things came into being, and they are all made for him. And not only are they created by Jesus Christ, but they are sustained by Jesus Christ. So Paul is developing this whole entire uh, thought and belief in Jesus Christ and says that the center of the Christian faith, faith is the person of Jesus Christ. And that person is not just the image of the invisible God, but God was pleased that all his fullness would dwell in the person of Christ. That everything God was could be seen in Jesus Christ. And not only that, but what God was doing, God's mission of redemption for the world was being done by the person of Jesus Christ. That through Jesus Christ, God was reconciling all things, bringing together once again all things through Jesus Christ. The center of the Christian faith is not a thought of belief or, or even commandments. The center of the Christian faith is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ who earlier in our worship service we confess to be divine, to be the Son of God, who died on a cross, who rose unexpectedly and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. At the center of our faith is this person named Jesus Christ. And we confess him as Lord. But is he Lord? Is he a liar? Or is he a lunatic? Well, perhaps it's based on who you ask. So, we'll come back to that here in a few moments. So, we're dealing with the question, do all religions teach the same thing? Well, if the center of the Christian faith is Jesus Christ, what do other religions say about Jesus? What do they believe about Jesus Christ? Now, what I want to do here over the next several minutes is to talk about four major religions and their beliefs concerning Jesus Christ. The slides will be up there. You'll have all this information. If you're not able to take all this information down and you want to have it, uh, come talk to me or send me an email or come find me in the office someday, and I will be happy to give this material to you. But we're going to cover four major religions. We're not going to cover all of them. We're not going to go in depth on all of them, but we're going to just concern ourselves with what they say about Jesus Christ. So the religions we'll cover are Judaism, we'll cover Islam, we'll cover Buddhism, and then we'll cover Hinduism. Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. So first up, we have Judaism. Judaism was founded between 2000 and 1800 BC. Now BC means before Christ, so it's 2000 or 1800 years before Christ. Now we have some familiarity with the Jewish faith because, well, we have part of their text within our scripture. The Old Testament are the Jewish texts that they hold to, that they continue to listen to, that they continue to hold fast to because they believe that through these texts, God is beginning his work of salvation and through the people of Israel, he'll bring about redemption for all people. So we have some familiarity with the Jewish faith. So what do they say about Jesus? Well, they say that he is Mary's son. They say that he is, was respected as a teacher and as a miracle worker, that he had many disciples and claimed to be the Messiah. Now, let me pause here. Claim to be the Messiah, we, 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 we think that that is a really important thing. Well, in the Jewish faith, there are a lot of people that claim to be the Messiah. And all too often, what they would do is they would start a revolution and then they would die. The Messiah for the Jewish people in Jesus' day was this person that they thought would be a warrior king who would uh, lead the people of Israel out from underneath the oppression of Rome into the promised land and into the kingdom that they once had. So Jesus was one of many to, be, to claim to be the Messiah. They do believe that he died on the cross, 
but his followers claim that he was raised from the dead. Now, the Jewish people don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe that God is one and that there is no, none other than Yahweh. And they don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Simple enough. We see this within our scriptures. We see that going back and forth. We have these sort of tales within our scriptures. So, Judaism, this is what they believe about Jesus. Next up, we have Islam. Now, Islam was founded at 700 AD, so 700 years after Jesus walked the earth. What they believed about Jesus was that Jesus was, in fact, born of a virgin, and that he was to, to be revered as a prophet and apostle of God, but, but that Jesus was not divine, and that Jesus was not God's son. For they believe, and you'll see this reference on the screen, that for Allah, their God, for God is only, Allah is the only God, and he has no son. That is part of the Muslim faith. They believe that he is a prophet and apostle of God sent by Allah to the world, but he's not divine, and he is not God's son. Further, what they believe is that Jesus was a wise teacher and that he was a miracle worker. Now, the majority of Muslims do deny that Jesus was ever crucified because what they believe is that before Jesus died, Jesus ascended into heaven, and he was brought up into heaven by Allah. Also, some Muslims claim that Jesus did, in fact, receive a gospel from Allah, but that his followers corrupted that gospel, and we don't know what that gospel truly is. So that's Islam, which was founded 700 years after Jesus walked the earth. Next up is Buddhism. Now, Buddhism was founded between 563 and 483 B.C. Once again, 500, 600 years before Jesus walked the earth. Now, a little caveat when it comes to Buddhism. Buddhism, in some ways, isn't really much of a religion. And so, some would say it is, some would say it isn't. Buddhism is more of a philosophy. It's a more of a way of life. And there are certainly some elements of Buddhism that, can, that we can take and apply within our Christian world. You'll see that here on the next slide. So Buddhists, more than not, don't really believe in the divine. They're more atheistic, and their goal is to reach enlightenment, to be detached from everything and to reach this enlightenment here on this earth. So, and here's the other thing. Buddhists believe very different things, but depending on which Buddhist you're talking to regarding Jesus. So, Jesus was an enlightened man. He was the one that attained the Buddhist goal of enlightenment. Jesus was also a wise teacher. They also say that Jesus was a holy man, and they admire him as a bodhisattva. I don't think I said that right, but what that means is one who denies himself out of compassion for others. And when we read the gospel, we see just that, that Jesus denies himself out of compassion for others. He is the Lord who decides to serve those who are around him. And he calls his followers to do the same thing. So you can understand where a Buddhist would look at Jesus and say, no, 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 he is not God. He just knows the path of enlightenment. So they admire him as one who denies himself out of compassion for others. And most deny that Jesus was divine. He was a holy man. He was a wise teacher. He attained enlightenment, but he wasn't divine. He was not the son of God. So that's Buddhism. Hinduism was founded between 1200 and 600 B.C. Now we're back again 600 years before Christ, 1200 years before Christ. And Hinduism is a little different. Uh, they believe that Jesus was a holy man, that he was a wise teacher, and they also believe that Jesus appeared as one of many of the God-men of history. That he was one of those special people that was a God walking in flesh among history, but he was one of many. He wasn't really unique, but he was a part of this whole collaboration to bring about nirvana, which is what Hinduisms are striving toward. Now, Hinduism is a lot like the Roman uh, religion, where they don't just have one God, but they have many gods. And they have all these kind of gods, so they had no issue. They have no issue in welcoming Jesus as divine, welcoming him as a god. But Jesus is one god 
among many. So, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. The question is, do all religions teach the same thing? Well, frankly, no. Frankly, they do not teach the same thing that we believe about Jesus Christ. Perhaps there are elements here and there, but they don't all teach that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, was the image of God, was the fullness of God walking upon this earth who came to die for our sins in order to set us free so that we too could be image bearers of God once again. So no, all religions don't teach the same thing. But it is fascinating. It is very interesting to me that even these religions that were founded long before Jesus ever walked this earth, before Jesus ever became incarnate, that these religions felt the need to make an account for Jesus, to describe Jesus in one way or another. And of course, they described him as a holy man, as a wise teacher and as apostle of God, but not son of God, not the God, not the one who had set us free from our sins. It is almost as though this Jesus demands some sort of response, no matter who we are. Going back to my bottom line for you today, Jesus, Lord, liar, or lunatic. For those of you who are familiar with C.S. Lewis, there is a section within his book on mere Christianity where this is kind of the title of it, where he is basically presenting these as three options for people to respond to uh, in terms of Jesus and having faith. And there is no way that I can present it nearly as well as, uh, as C.S. Lewis. And I was told that there was no way that I could present it nearly as well as Gray did for the youth. So what I'm going to do is we're going to show you a video. A video that has um, that section of that passage and, and some images. Now the audio quality isn't great. The video quality isn't great. But what I hope for you to hear is the demand that Jesus has on all of our lives that Jesus demands a response from each of us, whether he is Lord, liar, or lunatic. So let's watch it. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now, let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say he was a part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God, in their language, meant the being outside the world who made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was, quite simply, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. One part of the claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we have heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean the claim to forgive sins, any sins. Now unless the speaker is God, this is really so preposterous as to be comic. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. And yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. So this makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. Yet, and this is the strange, significant thing, even his enemies, when they read the Gospels, do not usually get the impression of silliness and conceit. Still less do unprejudiced readers. Christ says that he is humble and meek, and we believe him, not noticing that if he were merely a man, humility and meekness are the very last characteristics we could attribute to some of his sayings. 
I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So if Jesus is the center of our faith, if the very center and foundation of our faith is the person of Christ, and that person demands a response, I wonder what you would say. Jesus, Lord, liar, or lunatic? Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks that you walked on this earth and that you were the image of the invisible God that you have created all things and sustain all things, that all things were made by you and all things were made for you. Lord, this day, invite us to confess you as Lord, that as we confess you as Lord, we recognize that our main obedience is to you, it is not to our nation, it is not to our family, it is not to our church, but that our main obedience is given to you. For Lord, you are supreme over all. You are the firstborn among creation, the firstborn among the resurrection, and you are reconciling all things to yourself this day. Lord, as we live and breathe, we confess that we will have the courage to confess you as Lord and to live it out in our daily lives. Lord, we ask that you would make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry throughout all the world as we join together in the prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our final hymn, More Love to Thee, O Christ.
receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And as you depart from this place, may you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen.